Hi, everyone. We have a superhero on the show today, Dan Kittredge. He has been an organic farmer, expert, and teacher, uh, and really championed organic agriculture for the last 10 years, really bringing to the forefront the importance of nutrient density, why, how we can restore it, why consumers need to be interested and invested in it. And I couldn't be more excited to have him on the show. I'm working with him on a project. I'm a very small part of a huge progress or project he's working on too. So really, really excited. Thank you for making time to talk about nutrient density and sustainable agriculture, Dan. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, really, really excited. And like I was saying before this, I've been aware of his work for a very long time and he is way ahead of his time. But I'd really like you to take us back to the very beginning of this for you. What got you so interested in organic agriculture from the beginning? Well, organic agriculture, I grew up on an organic farm, so I didn't really have much choice about it. Um, <laughs> and it was actually... Um, it was an organic farm before they had a certification for organic. And wow. um, my parents, like a lot of farmers, were not able to make a living farming. And so their day job was actually running the organic movement in New England for 35 years. So mm. I um, I grew up in the middle of the organic community. It's like, that literally like <laughs> yeah. all the homes, yeah. no TV and the milk and cows and, you know, picking vegetables. And I, I, I grew up, I grew up that way. I grew up that way. I'm a, I like to say more Amish than English. The, if you ever hang out with the Amish, they talk about like whatever we would call normal Americans, they call them the English. So oh, interesting. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm culturally perhaps more Amish than English from my background, just growing up in that, that kind of culture. Um, Fascinating. And how is what you're doing, if it is at all, different from what your parents was doing? Can you can you kind of describe? Because I know you live on a farm right now. Yeah. Um, well, I think when I got married and had found no better way, I thought to raise kids than on a homestead. Mm -hmm. I thought I would do what my parents did, and I had been managing their farm in the summer and traveling the world in the winter and being an activist and stuff like that. And um, it was enough money to pay the bills, but it wasn't enough money to make a living to provide for a family. And, um, you know, I had very limited, I didn't need much money and that was fine. <laughs> but the uh, reality check was like, how do you, how do you actually make it, make it work in today's world? And this is uh, 05, 06. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so started trying to make a living farming and rapidly realized that I, like my parents and like a lot of other farmers couldn't make a living farming. And a large part of it was because my plants were sick. Um, you know, they were attacked by insects and disease. And, um, and I was like, you know, I always thought organic was better because that's how I was brought up. But I was like, if my plants are being attacked by insects and disease, you know, being eaten alive by a flesh eating fungus is not a sign of health in an animal it's actually not a sign of health in a plant. You know, being eaten alive by larvae is not a sign of health in an animal. It's not a sign of health in the plant. So I basically was like, maybe not using chemicals is good, but there's more to it. And mm -hmm. so that's when I started reading books and going to conferences and attending seminars and experimenting. And um, yeah, it really didn't take long at all. I mean, based on the fact that I had a lot of sort of you know, a practical experience. I just didn't have the sort of conceptual frameworks of, I didn't understand that plants were evolved by microbes to feed them. That like the way plants, the reason plants are green is because they make sugar to feed microbes and then the microbes feed the plants. And like, no one ever told me that. I didn't understand what, you know, the management of the soil is a process of supporting soil life. I thought I was just putting the plants in and keeping them wet and and weeded um mm. so when i was able to shift my management practices in such a fashion as to have my plants be healthy then my yield went up and my cost of production went down and i was pest and diseases were gone and i was making money working part-time and i was like my god i grew up on an organic farm my parents ran an organic farm organization i never do anything about any of this stuff maybe other people don't also and so that's when i started the bfa um um, and, uh, yeah, started giving workshops and courses to producers saying, I call it principles of biological systems. How did nature evolve things to work? And 
if you don't understand how it was evolved to work in the first place, then maybe you're going to do some things that are kind of productive and that's going to cost you more money and, and make it more difficult for you. And, and lo and behold, you know, we can build soil, we can sequester carbon. We don't need insecticides. We don't need fungicides. We don't need fertilizer. You know, yield goes up, economic viability goes up, flavor, aroma, nutrient levels, shelf life. Um, you know, I mean, you basically solve a lot of problems by working in harmony with life. Yeah. And so the idea was like, you know, it, well, let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> where's yeah. the, where's the organization out there, like specifically focusing on the principles of life and working in harmony with it, as opposed to good things like don't use chemicals and polycultures are beneficial. Um, like, you know, organic has wisdom and permaculture has wisdom and biodynamics has wisdom, but I never learned in any of those sort of sustainable ag alternate, alternate, you know, cultural frameworks, this sort of holistic, this is how it's evolved to work paradigm. Um, and, and very specifically, there was no organization focusing on the nutritional quality of the food or no network or no community saying the point of food is for it to be nutritious, which correlates with flavor, you know, by the way, mm -hmm. um, like we're wired with these really sophisticated nutrient monitoring devices called noses and tongues, which tell us which carrots are good for us and which carrots are not like, <laughs> or which carrots are better for us and which carrots are not, which peaches are better for us, which tomatoes are better for us. If a tomato doesn't have a taste, it doesn't have a lot of things in it that a tomato that does have taste does. And mm -hmm. so there was no organization out there talking about that. And so I was looking for something to do with my life. Um, you know, I was making my living working part-time farming and I was like, I was, I was bored. I wanted to, I wanted to do something. I, I felt a desire to like do something. Yeah. Uh, so I started to do something. <laughs> well, well, I'm so glad you did, Dan. I'm really inspired. And like, I like to think of you as like, we also interviewed Alan Savory for the series and it's like, he was yeah. way ahead of his time in animal agriculture and you are just the same your same level and creating a very holistic framework that kind of integrates all and sees the bigger picture and the, you know the microbes and the smaller picture so i want to go into the bionutrient food association and why nutrient density matters and microbes matter but i want you to you said something really interesting that i want to highlight two things can you tell us where did this disconnect from nature start it wasn't always this way that we were working against nature as we are in conventional ag. And then can you kind of tell us the, the differences? How would you define organic agriculture, conventional agriculture, and then maybe what you're doing in simpler terms? When did it, when did it start? Um, when did we get dis so disconnected? Like what are the origins of that? Agriculture? Yeah. Oh. 10,000 years ago? I mean, when was, I mean, I think indigenous communities, which were not hunter gatherers, but are very sophisticated polyculturalists, you know, permaculturalists, agroecologists, who are who are managing at landscape scale, you know, ocean to ocean across continents for fecundity. Um, you know, I think that's where we have to look for. It's, I mean, the story we're told in the West is before we had ag culture, we had hunter gatherers and you know that's what we're told in elementary school, but the but the science is not <laughs> is not saying that the science is saying that there was a very strategic landscape scale management of the ecosystem to facilitate optimal function, and that's what indigenous cultures were doing globally for millennia. Mm. Um, so you can go that far back if you want. I mean, certainly post World War II. Um, um, there was a lot of companies that were able to make uh, the ingredients for explosives and chemical weapons that they didn't have a market for anymore. And so they decided to have farmers be their market. And they, I mean, they basically bought the universities. And <laughs> mm. I, I think the new, the Common Ground, the new, the new movie that just came out, the sort of sequel to, to Kiss the Ground actually did a really good job um, laying that story out. I think that was one of the better things in that movie was like, how did it actually get co-opted by agribusiness? Like, and they lay it out really nicely. So for anybody who's not versed, that might be a place to look um, for the like the most recent 
set of years. But I think, I mean, historically, agriculture has has desertified about 40% of the Earth's land surface. Mm. So 40% of the Earth that is now brown didn't used to be brown. And it wasn't brown because <laughs> they hadn't practiced agriculture there. And when they practice agriculture there, they wore it out. Think of the Fertile Crescent, you know, Tigris and Euphrates. Like, it's desert now because we practiced agriculture poorly there and failed. Mm -hmm. And and that's happened a around a lot of the world. So, so it's really, I think, this not being in harmony or not understanding, you know, how nature works is is a deep is a deep cultural thing it's a mm -hmm. it's a spiritual thing it's a it's a um, <clears throat> yeah that was the first question you had i can't remember your question was how would i define conventional lag and how would i define organic was yeah i want you, i want to ask you one thing first too so you're saying agriculture in and of itself the way it's been practiced for ten thousand years can be destructive do you feel like like you said fertilizers and pesticides and our chemical based agriculture has that expedited the destruction or is that just Certainly. yes 100 percent. 100 percent. but but i mean tillage and monocultures <clears throat> you know growing grain I, there's a really good book uh what's it called um something about the it's about one side of the brain or left side of the brain um mm -hmm. but it just talks about how traditionally we had uh, our diets were much more full of of fruits and um, very strongly flavorful aromatic foods, which stimulated, which, you know, helped our right and left brain hemispheres connect better. And we were more intuitive and more tapped into our higher function because we were, the nature of our food had higher levels of these, you know, high order compounds, complex compounds. So wow. the act of eating grain, you know, having that be the foundation of your diet, certainly you get calories, but you don't necessarily get the complexity biochemically that helps you tune into your higher nature. Um, mm. So it's, it's not just about how you grow the food. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, you know, it's a, <clears throat> I don't know. It's a very I think it's really interesting and exciting. <laughs> I think it's absolutely fascinating. And you are studying left in the dark, it. left in the dark. It's called left in the dark. It's about, okay. it's about brain chemistry and the history okay. of when we moved from ag to agriculture and how that, decrease in polyphenols and terpenoids and alkaloids and phenolics and things like that started our brains not working as well. Um, Fascinating. So, and I know yeah. that that's one of the major findings too in Van Vliet's work in the Beef Nutrient Density Project is when you add, you know, these polycultures and healthy soils and uh, diversity of species, then you find those phytonutrients back even in animal products. So and and you can do it with carrots grown in a monoculture if you do it in such a fashion as to have the microbes in the soil flourishing. Mm, I right? love that. Yeah. So tell us. Okay, we'll skip that other question. Tell us what it, what were they missing? What what have you uncovered? Why are these microbes important? And what is nutrient density? And why does that matter too? That was like five questions. I know. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't think I've uncovered anything. No. I think I've been helping to put things together. Um, I think, I mean, I haven't learned, I, I haven't, I don't think I've like had any big, like, you know, relativity or, or whatever gravity, you know, it's like this piece is here, this piece is here, this piece is here, this piece is here. All these things are already there. They're already established in the, in the, in the chemistry and the biology and the biochemistry and the biophysics and the, you know, wherever you want to look at the science, the, the, it's, it's, evolutionary biology, the, the epigenetics. I mean, we have a ton of knowledge now in the Western scientific framework, which, you know, confirms this these foundational dynamics that indigenous cultures didn't need PhDs to tell them, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, from the sort of like the BFA is, a, is sort of like, it's got two aspects. One historically was the education courses, workshops, you know, conferences, sort of conceptual awareness raising, sort of practical empowerment. And then the most recent, it's like seven or eight years now, has been the research and the um, let's actually characterize variation. Let's, I guess that's maybe something we've done is, you know, we said we think that nutrient variation is significant in food. Like some carrots have a lot more of things in them 
than other carrots do. And most people who are scientists at that point in time said, no, it's maybe 2% or 5% difference, but it's not that much. Mm -hmm. um, and we're like, we think it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And we think it's connected to soil health because of our practical real world experience, because we're farmers, we're not like PhDs. Um, not that PhDs are bad, but coming from a practical experience, when your soil's healthier, your, <laughs> yeah. your, your crops really taste better. They really taste better <laughs> and they don't have diseases. And that's a real thing. And, and once you've seen it a number of times, you, you've raised potatoes for 20 years and the Colorado potato beetle always attacked them. And then you shifted your practices and the potato beetles didn't come again. And mm. the potatoes like got killed by frost instead of being eaten alive in July. Like that's a data point. Right. That's a data point. And so you do that with the cucumbers and powdery mildew and you do that with tomatoes with the, <laughs> and, and pretty soon you're like, okay, something's going on here. Um, and so, yeah, our, our thesis basically starting in 2017 um, was that nutrients do vary dramatically in food, like this carrot to that carrot, this tomato to that tomato, this milk to that milk. Um, A, that those nutrient variations connect to soil health. Mm -hmm. um, B, and that you can build a handheld meter mm. that could flash a light at a carrot or flash a light at a peach and tell you how good that carrot is. Okay. That not only do nutrients vary dramatically and the nutrient variations connect to soil health and carbon sequestration and all those ecological benefits, you know, if you can break it, you can fix it. If we can desertify land, we can re-green land. Right. It's not like it's it's gone as brown forever. We can totally turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we if, if we apply agriculture intelligently, we can heal so many things so fast. It's yeah. it's absolutely at our fingertips. Um, so we started in 2017 and and we had people send in carrots and spinach. We set up a lab. We and we just looked at like 10 different elements and a couple different compounds Um and it was, you know, like three to one or eight to one or 10 to one, like this carrot would have as much calcium as those three carrots, or this spinach would have as much iron as those 10 lines of spinach. Um, when it was polyphenols and antioxidants, it was like 20 to one or 40 to one. Um, so not small, right? Like two X, five X, 10 X, 20 X, like massive variation in nutrient levels in food. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we it took a number of years. But we sent in, we set up multiple labs, multiple continents, hmm. dozens of crops, um, thousands of soil samples, all kinds of management data, thousands of crop samples, and we pretty much categorically showed yes across the board: roots, leaves, fruits, and grains. We didn't do any animal products in the first five years. It was all it was all plant plants, um, but across the board, the variations are massive. Um, it does not connect to organic or to no-till or to different varieties or to soil types, the variations connect to soil life. Mm. Respiration, the level of life in the soil, the amount of breathing of living beings in the soil was the only thing we could find that correlated with increased or decreased nutrient levels. Um, wow. So that's I think that's pretty damn cool. And we built a meter that you can use to flash a light at carrots and cucumbers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Reading it off of it. So that's yeah. fascinating. And if you, when I had, when I was in school, I had to do a paper, oh, you comparing the nutrient levels between organic and conventional. And you're saying, right. this is why there's such confusion around that. There's topic. good organic and bad organic. Yeah. I mean, there's good Methodists and bad Methodists, right? I, I, just because you're a Christian does not mean you're in touch with the divine. You know, just because you're organic does not mean you have healthy soil. I mean, you can not use chemicals and 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 have dead soil. And lots of farmers do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how I grew up was, I mean, nature's got a report card, right? It's called pests and disease. Mm. And yeah, if you're growing food that's fit for animals to eat, animals will be your pests. Mm -hmm. If you're growing food that's fit for fungi to eat, fungi will be your pests. And fungi have different digestive tracts than animals do. And so the biochemistry, when this leaf is digestible for a fungus, it's not optimal for an animal. And why it's, is that happening? What are the conditions that create that? Uh, it's the gut flora of the plant is, is unhealthy, yeah. like IBS, right? When, you're, when your gut flora is not working right, you get sick. And it's the same with the plants. When, you're, when the soil life is not functioning well, 
the plant's not getting what it needs to flourish and nature's taking it out. Mm. Nature now, takes out the things that are unfit. I mean, that's, she's, she's, she's pretty, <laughs> she doesn't screw around. No. You're not fit for reproduction. You're dead. End of conversation. I love you that. Know, either love get that. better or, or, <laughs> yeah, or get out. And is, in your opinion, I know historically, like you said, there's a bunch of variation between plants, but I know historically there's at least some reports that our nutrient density is declining, even historically. So do you feel as though that's an important factor or is that just tied directly to the microbes and making nutrients available? Well, I mean, so if you look at the data set the USD has been using since the 1940s to characterize what's in a carrot or what's in milk, um, they, they have been using a fairly small sample set in 1940 or 1948 or whatever it is they did a, you know, leeks or, or, or black beans, maybe they would do 15 samples or something. Um, and every five or 10 years, they'll do another 10 or 15 samples. It's not like a massive data set. Right. Um, they'll go to 10 different stores in 10 different parts of the country. They'll send in the samples from those stores. Um, they'll take the highs and the lows and they'll get rid of them. And they'll find the average and say, this is what the average is. So the average of the 10 stores that they sampled in 1940 was higher than the average of the 10 stores they sampled in 2010. Mm -hmm. But it's not about the average carrot. I mean, you, there, there's no average carrot. You don't, you get this carrot or that carrot. You, there's no average human. So this whole concept that all milk is uniform, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's wrong. It's lying. It's, it's, it's dishonest. It's, 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 it's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> you got your little, fa your facts panel on the back of the, beef or the you know whatever it is your bar of whatever so much sodium so much protein it's not being tested mm. it's not being tested it's just it's like, yeah it's it, they they create a they create a number and everybody puts it on the back and it's like we all agree that we are you know the emperor has no clothes but we're not going to talk about it and so um you know those those traditional back panels on the back do not connect to what is, I mean, the the thing that's in the bag was not tested to see if it had that in it, right? This is, we need to start with that for starters. And yeah. then we're going to have a fat is way too big of a thing. And protein is way more nuanced. And I mean, carbohydrates, like, you know, like some are good, some are bad. Some fats are awesome. Some bats, fats are horrible. Some protein. <laughs> yeah, it's too Is it complete protein or is it amino acids? Or what's amino acids? What's amino acid ratios? Right. Yeah. That whole thing, that everything that we've got right now is just is just entirely insufficient. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so so my point is you have three grocery stores or two or five to choose from. And some of them probably have better carrots and some of them probably have worse carrots. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be buying carrots or milk or whatever you buy for yourself and your family. Most people do. Most people have some kind of a choice. And. So it's like, wouldn't you like to know which store has the better quality that you could, or if there's three bag, if there's three jugs of milk on the shelf, if you got your, if you got your, you know, your, I don't know, <clears throat> Organic Valley and Stonyfield and, and Horizon organic milk, like if which one was more nutritious and one was less, would that affect your choice of which one to purchase? Yes. I think so. And so- if we can help people make those decisions, if we can support people in saying milk is not all uniform, <clears throat> carrot not all uniform, it's not about what the average is in 2020 versus the average in, in 1950. It's about the three choices you have on the shelf. Mm. And if we can empower, if we can facilitate that empowerment where people can have honest understandings of which one's better, which one's worse, and they choose the better ones, then that's going to incentivize farmers to focus on building soil, which is going to reverse climate change, which is going to reverse chronic disease, which is going to create a dynamic where we don't need agribusiness. Mm. Um, so that's the strategy is get, help people choose what's better for them and their families. And through doing so, be a radical activist, yeah. really practically, you know, saving the world in a meaningful way. <laughs> you absolutely are. And can you tell me, I want to hear about your handheld meter. Like, tell us what you've developed. And also, first, though, what are farmers incentivized to do right now for anyone who doesn't understand? 
what are they incentivized to do right now? Yeah, what are they um, prioritizing at this point? Because it's not nutrient density. Right. Well, usually it's it's volume. <clears throat> you get paid on you get paid on on number of bushels. You know, it's, it's dollars per bushel or or dollars per hundred weight of milk or dollars per pound of beef or whatever. It's not. It's. I mean, I guess. There, I mean, there's some grading. You know, like the the carrots that are not totally straight get chucked because they're aesthetically imperfect or or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, primarily it's not about, and nutrition is not a metric. Um, and uh, so there's no incentive to focus on nutrition and money drives the world to a large degree. We all, a lot of us, you know, I think might've come to that conclusion <laughs> or better for <laughs> words, whether we well, want it to be true or not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just a little truth there. And so tell us, <laughs> about this handheld meter. I've been hearing about it and um, I know there's yeah. going to be several iterations and it's going to be cost effective, but tell us where you are in that process and how you came up with the idea. Oh, um, well, I mean, I watched my parents write some of the first organic standards in the country in the eighties. And I watched, you know, it turn into a, a movement where people knew what the word meant. When I was a kid, when I was in elementary school, no one knew what organic meant. And then when I was in high school, it somehow had, like enough people had heard the word and all of a sudden everybody knew what it meant. And um, and then about two years later, the government said, and now we're gonna take it over and own it. <clears throat> and it took them a couple of years to really take it over. And then the companies came in and now what it used to mean <laughs> and what it means are two different things, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I mean, pigs don't have to be outside. Chickens don't have to be outside. Like tomatoes don't have to grow in soil. I mean, it, it for starters, right? I mean, for starters, that's is cows don't have to eat grass. Yeah, it's, it's and they're like, still organic, exactly. Yeah. So, so I've watched, I've watched a good idea get perverted over time, and so my thought was, how do we take this good idea and and make it as hard to pervert as possible? How do we take a good idea and maintain integrity and strategically like outplay the, you know, rush to the bottom, you know, rush to scale and all that kind of stuff. Like how do, how do we set rules of the game that incentivize people to do the right thing? Like, um, and, and the idea was basically by not having a certification label, not having a bureaucracy, not having a binary, Right, with organic, you either are organic or are not. And what we're saying is some carrots are in the 80th percentile of what a carrot could be, some are in the 40th percentile, and some are the 20th percentile. And so what you want to know is if I got my oh, it's just an example of the of the milk, you know, got your, your stony field and your horizon, your and your and your organic valley. If one's 80 out of hundred, one's 78 out of hundred, and one's 40 out of hundred, that's different than if one's 80 and one's 40 and one's 20, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so like what we want to do is we want to be able to give people that level of, um, understanding that, that, that level of nuance. And the only real way to do that is by attesting it in real time, not by putting a label or a barcode or a QR code or <clears throat> whatever on a package, but actually being able to check it out in real time. And so that's like star trek right that's like a yeah. ray gun it's like tricorder yeah. um and yet it's what's how we know what stars that are hundreds of millions of light years away are made up of mm. right if we can test what things hundreds of millions of light years away are made up of with a flash of light <clears throat> maybe we should be able to test what something a millimeter away is made up of with a flash of light and like the technology in your smartphone now is like epically more sophisticated than the moon landers, right? What it took to land on the moon, the level of, of technology to land on the moon is like, your phone is like light years past that as far as sophistication and capacity and, 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 and processing speed. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a Luddite, you know, I think, you know, there can be proper uses for technology and this would be this would potentially be one, and so uh oh
Dan? Dan? We did, we did start by, you know, building our own meter in 2017. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, the, we had three questions. Do nutrients vary dramatically? Do they connect to soil health? The, if, if those variations exist, do they connect to soil health? And then three, um, is it possible for a cons to build a consumer priced, handheld, open source, flash of light meter that can give you real time, honest empirical readings of what's in food in real time. And so, yeah, we completed that by 2021. We sent out our few hundred of them around the world. It wasn't a definition of nutrient density. It was a, it was like, if you've got polyphenols that go from here to here, this the, the polyphenols in this carrot are in the 60th percentile of the range we found, mm -hmm. which is technically telling you something, but it's not what people want. What people want is, tell me how good this carrot is. And what is it, 80 out of 100, 20 out of 100? And to do that, we have to develop a scale to test, right? If we don't, if we don't have a definition of what 80 and 20 out of 100 are, then you can't build a meter that tests it because you haven't defined it yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing with Stefan. That's the project you're part of is with beef. Yeah. We've chosen beef as our first crop to work on where we actually we don't just characterize the highs and lows, like what's the range of copper and zinc and calcium and polyphenols. We say, at the end of it, we wanna say, this steak is an 80th percentile of what a steak could be, and this steak is in the 20th percentile. And we do that by looking at a much more nuanced set of factors, not just the hundreds of compounds in the meat, but also the hundreds of species in the manure, in the you know gut flora of the animal and the, the nature of the forage and human health trials and the soil metrics and the management practices, right? Overlaying all those things on top of each other, we hope will help us find red, yellow, green <laughs> or something. That's the project we're in. And then once you've done that, then you can calibrate a meter to it because you figured out what one in a hundred are. And, yeah. But we have to do that first. And that's where we're at. And it's expensive. And because we're trying to do it all open source, like in the commons, non-proprietary, it's not, it's not corporate, you know, data. It's not like the, it's not like the Facebook algorithm or some other kind of, you know, proprietary information. We want to do this for the, for the global commons. Like if everybody knows this is the foundation upon which meters are calibrated, then we can trust the meters. Then we can not, we can have a system that isn't, that's not pervertible. So yeah. that was a long answer to your question, but I think I got it. You covered it beautifully. And I'm not I, sure I did it at a fifth grade level. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, you did. You did. And that was, that was a really, really nice overview. And I, I thought I'm just really impressed. And like being part of this project, it's like, it is massive. You can't even believe it. I mean, it's a real pain in the butt. Sweet oats. I mean, you guys are just across the board. You are going for it. And it is, it is, it, it is really, really, um, I'm inspired by being part of this project. So I want to know though, why did you start with beef? A, mm -hmm. and then what are some of the findings that you're seeing? Kind of like if you can just overarching findings. Yeah. Nutrient density um, well, I mean, we ballparked it at a million dollars a crop as far as the cost of the science to to have our first definition of nutrient density. So wow. if we want to have a preliminary definition of good and bad in beef, it's going to cost us a million dollars. Preliminary definition in milk is a million dollars. In wheat is a million dollars. And so Thanks. that's a lot of money. And if if it's all charitable donations, $5, $10, $50 donations, I mean, it's a real pain in the butt. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> just the logistics of pulling this thing off is no joke. But the thought was better choose a crop that has some significant scale than one that doesn't. And okay. beef, I mean, there's more acres of land used in the production of beef than anything else on this planet. Mm. It is the crop with the largest global ecological footprint. There's more money spent on beef than any other crop on the planet. So it's the crop with the largest global economic footprint, the largest ecological footprint and the largest economic footprint. So if we're trying to shift 
the way agriculture is done on the planet to you know heal the environment to heal people and we're trying to provide a strong economic signal then and raising a million dollars is a real pain in the butt um let's choose a let's choose something that you know can give us serious <laughs> yeah you turn out investment cucumbers are nice but like even if we transform the entire global cucumber market it's not going to have that big of an effect as if we had some meaningful effect on the beef market um oh. And there's a bunch of really good producers out there doing a good job with their own labels and companies, you know, unable to differentiate, having a real hard time competing against the big boys. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's not like there's a bunch of cucumber farmers that are out there with their labels and like trying to make their, you know, and really pushing the envelope. Like, but there is a community of, of beef producers that are <clears throat> already there of, 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 and not just all, not just small. There's some big companies out there too. Some real big companies, you know, that are trying to trying to source um, honestly and 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 well and differentiate based on nutrition, um, but unable to make those claims. And so, um, yeah, we want to support the people who are trying to do the right thing. Um, I love that. And what has surprised you about the findings? What are we finding? Um, what are the surprising things, or what are some of the? Nothing surprising. Nothing. It's all surprising. totally predicted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Health of the ecosystem connects to health of the animal, connects to health of the human. Mm -hmm. it's, there's no surprise. It's it's not it's not a surprise. Our our, you know, it's what's exciting is we're actually doing the work of putting all the data together to be able to say it categorically in the Western rational, you know, scientific framework. Yeah. That even though we all intuitively know it's true you can't say it because it hasn't been published yet because no one's actually proven it yet. And so I think that's the big thing we're doing is, is, is proving it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, and just like you see, like there's a bronchema paper where grass fed is not grass fed and the, you know, the nutrient levels varied and organic, yeah. as you said, organic cows can be still fed grains. So yeah. Are you seeing any relationships to the system or to the practices in beef specifically? Right. So, I mean, I think the, the, the specific takeaway is that the greater the diversity of the forage, mm. the better the quality of the meat. <clears throat> so if you have a monoculture of ryegrass, um, that's better than corn, <clears throat> but a polyculture of five species in your in your pasture is way better than a monoculture. So it's a continuum. And the greater the level of biodiversity, as you know, you said you had Fred on as part of this. Yeah. Like the greater the biodiversity, the better the overall health. That's it's pretty much what it comes down to. Yeah. And now just to wrap up, the last thing I really want you to talk about is those microbes. So yeah. microbes are kind of at the basis, bottom of all of this. You know, what are the practices that one could, you know, use to enhance the level of microbes in their soil? Um, that's a long, that's a long, that's a long. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dan. I've got a 12 hour just... course online on YouTube for free. <laughs> You just go to YouTube and type in Dan Kittredge and, yeah. and I do a, 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 I call it a 12 hour stand up show. Um, <laughs> it's literally 12 hours of me with no slides, just rapping and, and, uh, juking and jiving and, and oh, no. <laughs> oh, do you have like three high level? Like, uh, are we, which are we talking about? Which, are... which by our region? I mean, okay. are we okay. Southwest? Are we in Ireland? Yeah. Are we growing cucumbers? Are we, what, what, are, are we, we integrating animals and plants together in one system are we using compost are we tilling are we is there anything are we adding you know minerals so so basic so basic 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 principles yeah. are that the microbes need a couple things to be alive and if any of those things are not present they are not alive mm -hmm. like they need air to breathe mm -hmm. so if your soil's tight they're dead, things don't work. They need water to drink. So if your soil's dry, they're dead, things don't work. They need food to eat. So if the soil's bare, they're dead, 
things don't work. Um, they need minerals to build their bodies out of. So if they're not there, they're dead. <laughs> they, they themselves must be there, right? If, if there's things that have happened to cause them to be dead in the past, they must needs be reestablished. So, I mean, it's about managing for air, water, food, minerals, and life. Mm. Obviously, you need sunlight. Obviously, you need warmth. I mean, some common sense kind of things. Don't go plant near peas in February in Vermont, right? You got to wait a little bit. Um, maybe you can do it in, <laughs> in Arizona. But <laughs> um, so it's everything is context dependent. Everything is site dependent. Everything is season dependent. You know, it's, there is no like series of like, there's no formal protocol because you're dealing with a living system. And that living system has historical things that have occurred. It's got, you know, five years ago, 50 years ago, 500 years ago, and it's got, you know, five days ago, five weeks ago, different things have happened. And so if you're not engaging your land, like it's a living being and ensuring it has what it needs to live, you know, you can no till all you want and be proud of yourself, but you don't have water and who cares, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of nuances here that, you know, are actually pretty much common sense when you get down to it. But in many cases, people have been like, I'm a no-till farmer. I'm regenerative. I use compost. I believe in foliar sprays. Like, <clears throat> those are great tools to have in a toolbox. But what you need to do is create a dynamic where life has what it needs at all points in time. And so um, that's the essence of the course. And sort of, you know, the foundational work we were doing for the first day or 10 years of the organization, we still do it. But um, it's, I mean, we've taught this course around the world, all kinds of different places, different scales, urban, rural, north, south, rich, poor, big scale, small scale, grain, animals, perennials, vegetables, like all over. And the principles work all over the entire planet. Mm. Um, and so now it's a question of like, okay, if this works, if we can actually reverse climate change, if we can reverse chronic disease, if we can suck the life force out of agribusiness and pharmaceutical industry, like if we can solve a lot of systemic problems, like let's start working on it. And so that's where all the science and the meter and everything else comes in. It's like figure out a way to align economic incentive with ecological and health and sort of cultural incentive um so well it's truly amazing what you're doing and thank you you did you made that simple and high level and it was exactly <laughs> what i was looking for nice work right, good. Level. Took okay, a minute. Dan. <laughs> well, it, it's been such an honor so i want you to tell us now uh what have we missed what do you think is important for this conversation if anything that uh, we haven't yet shared or talked about and then just tell people where they can connect with you and keep abreast of when that next meter will be out, all of the other projects, where do we follow Dan Kittredge? Um, good question. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, so we have a website. It's the it's bionutrient.org is the organizational website. We're a nonprofit, we're an educational organization. We happily take donations. You know, five dollars a month is great. Mm -hmm. You know, if you and ten thousand other people were giving us five five dollars a month, I mean that would be massive. Yeah. Five bucks a month. So uh, bionutrientinstitute.org is where all the science um, stuff is recorded. Um, if you do go on the website and you give us your email, we'll send you our monthly newsletter. Um, we have the various social channels, of Instagram and Facebook, and we've got a ton of stuff on YouTube. Um, so certainly um, those are all possible vectors of, of ways to follow and be engaged. Um, um got local chapters i think you know we're talking about doing this bricks campaign where until we've got a meter you can use the old-fashioned refractometer which was developed in i think it was 1830 um which has no battery which costs 30 dollars, and you have to squish the carrot to get a drop of juice out of it to get a reading so you can't just flash a light in the store uh -huh. but if you did have 50 people around the country that all went to three grocery stores in town and bought a bag of carrots and took them home and tested them, we could begin to get that information out now about like, 
you know, is Bunny Love better than Cal Organic? And where does, you know, Both House Farms sit? And is Whole Foods really better than Walmart? Um, you know, so, I mean, there, there, we have all kinds of grassroots kind of things like that going on um, while we're waiting for the $50 million to magically arrive so we can do all this complicated science so we can hand over the algorithm to the yeah. Apple and Google and yeah. let them make it few billion dollars <laughs> oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh well i'm gonna join that effort i definitely encourage all of you to donate or join those grassroots efforts and i just thank you for all the work you're doing and do you think we missed anything or do you have any famous last words of wisdom i i mean which i got all kinds of rants i go on i mean personally i think this is a spiritual covert op i think this is about grounding consciousness i think that we are um able to tune into our higher nature to the degree that we are vibrating coherently, that there's all these octaves of reality. There's the emotional body and the mental body and the prana body and the, you know, physical body. And it's like, it's like harmonics. It's like, um, you know, the piano keyboard, or I don't know how to say it. I don't have time to go into my full sort of rant on the topic, but I really do think that as we build more coherent bodies by eating better quality food, as we become more well, we're more able to tune into our higher natures and um, and manifest our full potentials more well. And we've got problems in the culture with economics and politics and, and media. And I mean, where do you wanna look for problems in the culture? And I would say that we're about three generations in to eating quite poor quality food and we are degenerating <clears throat> and we are relatively incoherent and our actions in all of our works, the teachers and the media people and the, you know, the ec ec economics people are all, we're all vibrating at a relatively low level compared to our potential. Mm -hmm. And that if we do begin to eat food that is of better quality, we will become more coherent and our effect on the world will become more coherent. And so I think we solve the world's problems by, by becoming more well ourselves. And you, I mean, you get a new body every six months. I mean, literally like, you know, your bones take longer, your blood takes less time, but average it out effectively every six months, you get a new body. And if you start eating food, that's more coherent now, your level of being in a relatively short period of time will be much better. Mm -hmm. And so that's for me, the objective here is to raise consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can be really tuning into our higher natures until we're vibrating relatively coherently in the physical plane. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my real agenda. Yeah. Um, well, that speaks to me. <laughs> I mean, that's my life story. I was troubled, yeah. troubled, kicked out of my parents' house, you know, just like surviving and then I tried something different and yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm, I see the world differently because of it. So it's, yeah. The hormonal imbalances, this, the, 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 all that stuff is biochemical, yes. right? It's biochemical. It's like, if we, if our bodies are not able to build themselves, basically we begin to vibe out, we become dissonant, yeah. right? It's, it's, and, and so many kids are brought up. Oh, I know three generations in epigenetics with no idea of what's happening to them. And I mean, there's people that are like in their teens and twenties that are like on the edge of death, right? Like that's no joke yeah. and they didn't have a chance. And like, that's not okay. It's not okay. I know it's really sad. And my son is a little embarrassed because we eat so differently than everyone. And so, yeah, it's time for an awakening and you're clearly at the forefront of that. So Dan, this has been better than I'd ever imagined. Everybody go check out his work and um, just thank you for everything you do. Thank you very much for having me. Okay.